we just had the conclusion to game seven of the World Chess Championship between Gukash and Ding. Let's get into exactly what happened in this pivotal game where Gukash would have the white pieces once again. Now, the match has been going back and forth. Draw, 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 but there's been an advantage in most of the games. In this one, Gukash started with Knight F3, and honestly, myself and the fans are just kind of waiting for who is going to take their opportunity. It's not like the opportunities have not been there. So it's starting to get a little frustrating no matter which side you're on because you feel that there are chances to be taken. Knight F3 is definitely a surprise, but it's a very flexible move, especially played by a top player. They know that they can go back into, you know, whether it's an E4, D4, C4 system. Knight F3, just flexible. Um, waiting to see a response by the opponent and then transpose perhaps back into something favorably. Ding responds with just D5. And immediately with g3, g6, d4, we can see that Gukash is kind of setting up, you know, some type of Catalan setup here. We see c4, bishop g2, castles, and, you know, while it is a, a bit of a Catalan setup for white, black has responded differently rather than having maybe e6 and perhaps bishop e7 or bishop d6, which you would normally see. Instead, we have this setup. So I think this actually you know, kind of gets referred to as a bit of a Grunfeld setup, um, like a Grunfeld Slav with this pawn structure here. So black's planning to castle, and then in some cases, uh, these pawns actually get exchanged, but otherwise, this bishop, you can see it's a little bit of an issue here. Black would never want to play e6 and lock that bishop in, so we'll normally see the bishop develop, uh, if it could even go to f3, uh, to g4, excuse me, and then capture on f3, that would be great. Black often does not mind giving up the bishop pair here if it's light square bishop because you just give that up and then knight d7 and the rest of your pieces, you know, it's pretty obvious where they go. We see castles and I, personally, I thought that this move, uh, rookie one, and you know, I'll just show this next move to show you the time difference. Look at that, an hour and 27, an hour and 55. So Ding spent pretty much half an hour responding to this move. This was the first key moment of this game seven. So rookie one, what the heck is this move, right? Are we playing the move e4? Well, not exactly, but it looks like we're preparing for e4, which means it's kind of playing into the move d takes c4. So rookie one is definitely played in anticipation of d takes c4. It doesn't mean that black should stay away from, from pawn takes pawn, and we see Ding eventually did not, but this is a very clever and interesting idea from Gukesh, and this is clearly what he brought to the table today in this game. So this is the idea. If black does not take and instead plays one of the, the normal moves, I think the advantage that Gukesh is trying to claim is that this move is useful, but he's also not committed some of the other pieces. So depending on what black does, he could respond in a specific way. Whereas if he had played knight c3, then maybe black gains the information about, oh, the knight's gonna go there. I'm gonna place my pieces in a specific way that work best against knight c3. So instead, white's kind of holding the cards a little bit, saying, okay, you show me where you're gonna put your pieces, and then I will respond. Meanwhile, making a move that's generally gonna be useful. And I think the main downside with rookie one is that, well, it kind of allows the pawn to be captured here. So interestingly, Ding does something that I think more players should do. If you're sitting there at the board, your opponent surprises you with a move and you really, you're just looking at maybe a pawn, like a gambit or something, and you just don't see the problem with it. At some point, you have to trust yourself more than you trust your opponent. Um, and Ding does that. He just takes it. This is a common move. Black is not always, <clears throat> not always trying to hang on to this pawn. So Black's not taking this thinking, okay, we're going to hang on to this pawn. I'll be up a pawn the entire game. Not at all. But the move E4 was played after this bishop g4 and clearly ding is is kind of connecting a few of the plans that we've talked about here taking the pawn but also playing bishop g4 with the intention to capture on f3 knight bd2 simply trying to take back here and at this point i thought that b5 was going to be played because taking on c4 and then just allowing it to be taken back that doesn't feel like the trade that you want to make as black at that point 
you're just trading your center pawn for wing pawn and also white's regaining it immediately so i'm trying to feel like I'm trying to understand what was the downside for white right this all just looks good so ding plays the move c5 here the engine you know probably harshly gives this a, a question mark but it's understandable because white gets a very nice looking position after the move d5 b5 while it's not my style of of play it does seem like it's a consistent move it's a move that makes sense to play after capturing on c4 so i'm not exactly sure here but it did feel like ding was kind of caught off guard by rookie one so i give credit to gukesh with a, with a very interesting move um preparation but then you know the next series of moves c5 allowing d5 at this point we're getting into a structure which kind it looks a little bit like a benoni structure here but white is going to regain this pawn now the move b5 is not as effective very very well known that the move b5 is undermined nicely by the move a4 so this is a great move for you guys to be familiar with if the rook is not defended in the corner then a4 works like a charm because you cannot support it with a6 so you either need to push or to capture and you can just see the quality of the pawns is going downhill and white can capture back immediately so after d5, we see e6, naturally breaking up the pawn structure, but h3 to, first of all, get rid of the pin, but also just force black's hand. We see captures. If the knight takes, white's just taking back on c4 here, also hitting the b7 pawn and the knight through an x-ray. So many, many good things happening for white. This bishop is going to be so powerful here. Black does not have an answer to the light squares. And as I mentioned, b5 is no longer an option. So at this point... Ding playing knight d7, I think that white's preferable. This is clear. I, I thought that Gukesh had a good opening. Definitely, I thought he was slightly better here. Um, b5 not possible. He recaptures the pawn on c4. Now, the one thing that's good for Ding is, you know, he's worked out a way to get b5. If, I don't know, h6, right? If white gets to play a4, this game is over. Such a good position for white. Stopping the move b5 is absolutely key. So, very important that Ding plays the move b5 and that white doesn't have these moves available, otherwise the knight would sink itself into this great c6 outpost. But that cannot happen, and we see the knight has to choose a pretty, <laughs> well, not a great retreat here, uh, undesirable to say the least, knight a3. Um, once the b-pawn is defended, you know, this knight really has to work to get back in the game. So, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, well, hang on. Why didn't we just go this way in the first place? Well, it blocks the bishop, it blocks the rook, it's just kind of in the way, and it doesn't really have another square to go to. So, in the meantime, Gukash is saying, well, let me put the knight on a3. I can still develop the bishop, the rook is still exerting pressure, I've got d6 coming, and if needed, I can bring the knight back into the game. But for the moment, it's more important for my bishop and rook to be able to see the rest of the board. So we can see that bishop to f4 played immediately after. It's not going to be harassed by the knight, so it's a very safe piece, and the bishops are starting to look alive here. Rook e8, queen d2, and I thought this was all pretty well played by, by both sides. Like, Ding's opening was probably not ideal, but he was caught off guard by this move, rook e1, and, you know, he's at least got an imbalanced position where he's fighting against this uh, pass pawn, but also isolated pawn. Because from white's perspective, yeah, it's a pass pawn. It's, it's very strong. It's going up the board. From black's perspective, it's a weakness. It's an isolated pawn. We have to target it. So that's going to be what both sides are trying to prove. Rook d8, knight c2. The knight is making its way to e3. But first, a very, very nice move, b4. Um, it looks like a move you'd never want to play because why are we handing a protected pass pawn over to black? Well, first of all, the knight on, on f8 is kind of dominated here. Uh, yes, there is a pin, but... A little bit artificial in general the knight can't use the e6 square it's not something we can rely on so the knight doesn't have a, a bright future this bishop takes a while to be activated and it's really just a one move threat what we've done here is we've actually carved out the d4 square for our own use with the white pieces the bishop can reroute the knight can use and also we have this move a4 to undermine and start using the a file so i really really like this move b4 Later on, this b-pawn will become quite weak. Let's say with a a4 captures, rook a5, knight d4. So white first repositions the bishop. Again, most of the time knight takes d5 here is not going to be possible. 
first of all, the rook can be taken, which would lose the, the piece. Also, the bishop can be taken on g7, uncovering the queen again. So it's not a reliable pawn for black to capture. However, after capturing here, Ding decides, look, this position is not very good. Instead of sitting here suffering, I'm going to suffer for a pawn. So he decides to take on a2. And this is where you know that the pawn sacrifice is already at least good for Gukesh. Because Gukesh pretty much has a draw whenever he wants it. The queen on, on b3, I mean, there's rook a3. Yes, queen b1 check, but... We can see that once the white king moves, we'll be able to chase the queen with rook a3, rook a1, back and forth, and that's just it. If you have a draw by repetition pretty much whenever you want it, then you already know, at, you know, bare minimum, your sacrifice was probably okay. And still, this pawn is, is always kind of taboo just because of the problems with bishop takes g7 and bishop takes on d5. So... Ding does capture the pawn, very risky decision, uh, but he's definitely calculated and calculated properly that his queen doesn't get trapped. That's the main thing. It definitely can get chased around. Uh, he's got to, got to settle for a draw here if Gukesh wants it, but Gukesh has played a very solid game. He came up with a nice opening idea. He's transitioned that into the two bishop advantage. I love the move B4. And while Ding is, you know, he's holding on, he hasn't really made any blunders. He's certainly worse here and this is now Gukesh starting to dominate the board. The coordination after King G2 is unbelievable. So you've got the A pawn loose. You've got to draw whenever you want it with white. I thought that Gukesh was very much in control here. We see Rook D7, Rook A5, and this was the, you know, could have been repetition, but Gukesh, had, Gukesh has shown in this match, and certainly in a recent game, he's willing to play on, right? Um, I saw a Ding interview where he even said, in response to the previous round, oh, uh, we thought it was gonna be a repetition, and then Gukesh, from a worse position, actually played on, and Ding was like, yeah, I, I almost wrote the wrong move on my score sheet, because I was so surprised by that. Um, so he's really he's really here to fight. Queen b3, rook takes b5, queen d3. We're starting to see not only time getting low for both of these players, 15 minutes, but also Gukesh really starting to take control. I'm not sure how to describe it perfectly yet, I'll find the words eventually, but I do feel that in, in the middle game, you know, with many pieces on the board, I find that Gukesh is, is very sharp, very well calculated. He often ends up on the better side of things, um, you know, when, when there's a, a bunch of calculations. And and here, Gukesh, while Queen F4 is, is labeled a miss, it's labeled a miss because of a pretty weird engine move, which is, you know, a backwards bishop move, bishop E3. You know, it makes way for... Uh, defense of the the d pawn here and i mean otherwise i would say fairly cryptic we can take the queen and play knight e1 to grab the pawn afterwards but bishop e3 not the easiest move to play personally i thought that queen f4 made a lot of sense and you know the move that black is supposed to play here is another weird engine move g5 like i'm still trying to understand it myself so queen takes the knight white takes the knight on f6 so it's pretty much a trade right there and Ding is kind of forced into, you know, the rook's coming to c5. We're trading this bishop. That pawn should be a goner. The knight is literally trapped on f8. It has nowhere to go. It's not been a good piece all game. So Ding decides, I will do this, give up a pawn, but get into an end game. My pieces are active and hope to hold the draw. And this was the phase of the game where I wasn't entirely convinced by Gukesh's technique. And, you know, it's, it's time to start having the tough conversations um so we get to knight g6 rook takes c4 firmly up a pawn we see a, a few knight maneuvers but gukesh playing admirably here he he staved off the you know winks of counterplay that that ding was hoping for and now after this move he's he's very clearly slightly better here i think he may have lost some of his advantage but take a look at the time as well I think from a practical perspective, this is a very, very good attempt. And we even see Ding spending a lot of time, three minutes on King F6, H6, and then a ton of time on King E5. This move took all his time until the time control. This was move 40. So it was the final move he had to make before he received more time. And obviously, as you can see here, it is labeled blunder by the engine, mainly because of this move right here, Rook H4. While Ding reclaims the center pawn, 
Gukesh is happy with that. He traded a pawn that was probably not going anywhere for a strong outside protected pass pawn and still maintains his one pawn advantage. Ding follows up with honestly a move that, that does make some sense, but knight c3 reminding me of the interesting uh, chess, I don't know, phenomenon where they say that it's very, very common. Almost the most common place to blunder is not right before time control, but actually just after it the move after it, the second move after it. I don't know, your guard is down, you're just, you're not processing, uh, you're, you're off the adrenaline of the time pressure. I don't know what it is, but I can speak from experience. It's happened to me too. For some reason, that's when a lot of blunders happen. So here's another one, knight c3, although I don't particularly think this is uh, you know, a blunder because it loses a pawn or it, or it loses a knight, nothing like that. It's just more the coordination. And at this point, we were all kind of waiting for Gukesh to maybe get that pawn rolling, but, End games are always trickier than you think. And this is where I need to start having the tough conversation. We see the move King E1 from Gukesh. He's got 27 minutes on the clock. He's got an outside protected pass pawn. He's played a great game. He had a great bit of opening preparation with rookie one. Whether or not it was stellar, it definitely worked out and gave him a great middle game position, which I, I thought he converted well into this. He used his opponent's time pressure against him. He's better. Now, if I'm thinking of, you know, world champions of the past, especially Magnus, most recent one, what's going on here? Magnus is winning this position in his sleep, it would feel like. So I don't know if it's nerves. I don't know if it's technique. As I said, Gukesh does seem to be phenomenal in the earlier stages of the game, but whether it's the technique or the nerves, uh, it goes both ways. Ding not playing on his advantages uh, as well. So I haven't been fully satisfied with his uh, ability to push, but this is probably the most sizable advantage in the World Championship match uh, that you could actually action on, you know, aside from obviously the, the games that were won by the players. What's going on here? What's going on here? This is a serious advantage. I think that it's one you should definitely expect a player of uh, both of their calibers to be able to win with white. Immediately we see a move that kind of goes astray. Now, a very logical move, like the, the move itself has some sense. There's rook d2 and knight d2, and this move kind of takes care of both of them. However, the move f6 is played, it cuts the rook off a little bit, passes the move back to white. Okay, h4, seems like a very logical move. All of a sudden, we see the rook get down and counterplay. Rook to d3 and bishop to d1, another blunder played by Gukesh. So in a series of a couple moves, the engine has gone from, you know, plus two, plus three. You know, this is a very generous engine, but just to give you an idea, clear edge for white, for sure. Anyone can admit to a position like this, where after the move f4, it's more likely that black is making a draw. If not, you know, the result seems almost guaranteed at this point. The pawn structure is being broken up. The king is super active. The bishop has become very passive. So I don't know what happened, but the last three, four moves from Gukesh, to put it mildly, were, were terrible. It has to be said. Um, I don't know where this advantage went. It just completely disappeared. Uh, definitely the move h4 is, is logical. There are reasons why he didn't play it, but one way or another, the advantage has disappeared in a matter of, of moments, three, four moves. How can that happen? Game seven of a tied world championship match you have the white pieces, you've played a great game. You know, if you're not winning this game, what games are you going to win? It's not to say like Ding didn't play great defense, but here it's not about Ding's defensive moves here. He did do a good job, but this feels more like Gukesh not playing the 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 game properly more than Ding defending it. Because I think even if Ding played amazing defense here, white should probably win. And I've definitely come to expect that, you know, watching Magnus play any level of a, of a serious match, high pressure match situation, he, he wins these. So that's just the way I see it. Uh, both guys in this world championship match seem a little bit timid and just not confident converting their uh, advantages, but this one just felt like the biggest missed opportunity. Um, so we continue here, but you can see after rook d3, bishop d1, as I said, f4, tremendous move by Ding. The pawn chain gets broken up. This pawn is much uh, less of a threat without a, a pawn nearby to support it and just watch over it. Now it's, you know, definitely a weakness as well. Like black can target it as well as it being a pass pawn. Whereas previously it was mainly just an asset. 
So bishop c2, rook c4, you might think that this, you know, wins the knight or, or certainly liquidates favorably, but the move f5 is so strong. If this goes to a rook endgame, not only is this pawn hanging, but the rook could swing over to the h file as well. Rook b4, king up to f3, and there's just so many problems now as the king is incredibly active. All black's pieces just activated, and whites are all retreating, passive. How did this white rook go from, you know, taking the h pawn to all of a sudden on b4? What's going on here? The bishop was out on f3, now we're back on d1. The pawn chain has been broken up, so just nothing but, but you know, a lack of progress here from, from white. The rook b3, rook e5, f4, a nice try to play rook e3 and h5, but at this point, time was getting low for Gukesh. Understandably, he's, he knows he spoiled his advantage, and Ding, to his credit, I think defended basically perfectly from this point on. There wasn't much to the rest of the game, but honestly, ever since that move f4 breaking up the pawns, I think this game was destined for a draw. He collects the pawn, and yes, again, there's a little bit of technique shown by Ding, but this is his, you know, the easiest work of this game for him. He chases the pawn, uses the knight to corral it. If the pawn would move up the board, again, it could be knight d6. We just kind of hunt the, the pawn down. Um, it's very, very difficult to hang on to. And also, we're in a position where Ding is the one that knows, like, he knows at this point that this pawn is going to be caught. So uh, he's confident that he's making a draw, basically. Bishop c2, knight d6. And we see rook d8, but you know, with the knight and bishop here and the king so far away from the action, black's activity easily secures him the draw here. Knight f7 was a nice move, but again, this, this technique should be expected for uh, someone of Ding's caliber and the rooks get traded and Ding just simplifies into the absolute draw, which is a great result for him, all things considered. If you take the game as a whole, I'm still impressed by, by moments of Gukesh, like the opening especially, the middle game, the way he turned a slightly better position into a huge advantage. But Ding, you know, he stayed in there. He never completely botched it. Even at the end when Ding blundered, and I think Gukesh had his chance, he didn't He didn't take it. So not a perfect game by Ding. He definitely would have lost under other circumstances or uh, perhaps against either another player or Gukesh on a better day or a different day. But not today. And that's probably going to come back to to bite Gukesh. I don't know. Both players have left points on the table. As I said, I have complaints about both. Ding just refusing to play on his clear advantages that he's getting against Gukesh. But guys, this one was the worst. I have no explanation. I have no words. It's game seven of the world championship in a tied match. You have a massive advantage up a protected outside pass pawn in an end game. And two, three moves later with lots of time on the clock, the advantage completely disappears. So obviously disappointing for me, just observing uh, the game from a neutral perspective to see both players leaving stuff on the table. But I truly think that, yeah, this was one of the, the toughest, like the most winning position that was left on the table. And obviously as Gukesh, uh, as a Gukesh supporter, that, that would be extra tough to see. So again, we remain tied in the World Championship. We have another game coming tomorrow. As always, I will be back with the recap first thing when the game is done but that's it for game seven let me know what you guys thought about this game in the comments down below and i'll see you guys in the next one